Okay. Slide will change momentarily. Good morning. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law under COVID-19 emergency declaration, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting have the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and activate it by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Call-in users can unmute by using star six. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. We have provided a link to the meeting for those who wish to speak on a particular case via our website and email. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comment on a particular matter. And if you are not speaking, please keep your microphones muted. Mr. Chairman, the meeting is yours. Okay, Fred, you want to call the roll, please? Yes, Bowen. Present. Downing. Present. Fluker. Present. Curry. McCray Scott. Paul. Present. Slife. Present. Okay, we have a quorum. The first is a special presentation, public art. This is a wordsmith mural at RTA 12000 Euclid Avenue. Tara, are you going to start off first? And I'm going to uh, recuse myself for this one. Thanks, Tommy. Um, I don't see her. So, Mary Beth, are you here for this one? Yeah, I think Stami or uh, Rachel is on the phone and Luce and Rachel, I think, is going to present. Okay, uh, Rachel, go ahead, please. Okay, um, as you guys have seen um, pretty recently, we've been uh, doing a lot of these presentations on Wordsmith as he's coming to Cleveland here. Um, he'll be in the city the week of August 6th. Um, next slide. <clears throat> um, those of you that have seen, he's Cleveland born and raised, um, currently residing in London, um, but is a Los Angeles based street artist. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just a little bit more about him um, and his journey. Um, he'll be doing 15 murals around Cleveland uh, during this wordsmith tour hosted by Graffiti Heart. Um, next slide. These are just a few examples of his art for those of you that have not seen it. Um, next slide. <clears throat> One of these, uh, a couple of these will actually go in here in Cleveland. Uh, next slide. The How Do I Love Thee Tour, um, like I said, it's a series of 15 plus small to medium tour pieces um, throughout Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. The one that we're going to be discussing today is the RTA um, University Circle piece. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so this one is going at uh, 2000 or 12,000 Euclid Avenue. Um, they no longer have the RTA signage here. So basically you can see the mock-up 
Now is the time. Where do you want to go? What do you want to see? How do you want to explore? So if you go to the next slide. This is basically the, the overview of where it's going to be. You can see the Cleveland Institute of Art over here, and it's just east of um, east of that in this little um, building just under the railroad tracks, essentially. Um, we wanted to find an authentic palette uh, here in Cleveland for him to use. Next slide. <clears throat> Here's a closer version. As you can see, it still has like the RTA signage, which won't exist anymore. Next slide. And next slide. Next slide. Oh, okay. That has a couple less slides than I thought. Anyway, so uh, we wanted to find an authentic palette. <clears throat> the RTA is fully supporting this um, mural. Uh, we It will be power washed, so there is some remaining um, anti-graffiti, as you can see here, um, which will be power washed. So we'll have like a clean palette to work from. Um, the work is meant to provoke and um, promote travel and will serve those that use the RTA services. Um, and we're really excited to have Gord Smith here. Um, and I think that's it. So our Thank you. Shift, if, if I can, um, this is the old 120th Street station on the red line. You know, we moved it. And um, it stays on because there's a substation inside of it. Um, if it is authentic, it's been there a long time, and we, we are really pleased that um, if you know where it is in the neighborhood, you do sort of wander there, and it's great that we can make this a piece of art until we figure out what else to do with the substation. And we also, while you haven't approved it, we are also working with Stami and Wordsmith to do some in Tower City as well as part of the um, public art diversity campaign that we're undertaking. Thank you, Mary Beth. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the site. So great palette for this art. Uh, commission members. I move approval. Downing. Second. Luker. Okay, we have a motion second. Lillian came onto the uh, system, but she's recusing herself from this because she must have something to do with the funding of it. So uh, Freddie, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fuker. Yes. yes. Curry. She's abstaining from this one. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Paul. She's abstaining also. Uh, and Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Nice to see you, Mary Beth. Garden of 11 Angel Memorial Plaza Monument. 12201 and 12215 Imperial Avenue. Uh, who's here for this one? Good morning. Uh, this is Keisha Chambers. I'm here to do the introduction for this. I'm Garden of Eleven Angels. You have seen the plaza that has been presented and passed by the Planning Commission. Thank you for that. But today we are here to present the monument itself. Um, this was considered um, public art as well as signage. And so we went through the process separately for the monument. I have David Wilson with Land Studio and Scott Whitley with Whitley and Whitley Architecture. And they will be providing the um, details for this submittal. So I will allow uh, or invite Scott to continue. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy, happy to be here again. Uh, today we're presenting for the monument itself uh, so, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to see what slide we're on. All right, uh, starting with the design of the plaza itself, I think uh, uh, the design of the plaza established some of the goals for the monument itself. And the plaza is in the shape of the infinity symbol. And uh, part of that uh, concept will flow into the actual monument design. Next slide. Here is the actual design itself of the monument. Uh, some of the design goals of the monument is first and foremost, the uh, 
Uh, the monument is the centerpiece of the entire memorial plaza. So we wanted to pick uh, materials that were are, were appropriate for a, a, a centerpiece. Uh, and we went with a polished granite. We also went with uh, the granite because going back to the previous slide and talking about the infinity shape of the plaza itself, the uh, choice of uh, the black granite is a, a material that we felt was uh, everlasting, something that could endure and uh, uh, would uh, take the abuse of, of people coming in and out and, and viewing the monument at all times. Uh, you can go back to that, preview, that next slide. And then my interpretation of the monument, I did not design the monument, but my interpretation of the monument is that it is uh, an abstract uh, sculpture of angels or angels' wings. And, and that, in my mind, represents the 11 angels of the, uh, of the lost souls that we lost on this site. The monument is also designed to be viewed from all sides. And with the choice of material, uh, we think it's uh, the material choices, uh, uh, a choice that you can touch and interact with. And uh, it, it was also designed so that we can be able to place words, uh, the names of the victims, a poem, and uh, that people could read and hopefully be thought provoking. Next slide. And this is the actual dimensions of the monument. The monument is pretty much roughly seven feet wide, uh, sitting on uh, uh, these two 16, you know, uh, eight inch pedestals. Uh, so it's about seven feet wide by six feet tall. Next, next slide. And on this slide, I will pass it over to David. Thank you, Scott. Um, the, the format of the, the, the lettering, um, as Scott mentioned, um, to be a three, 360 degree experience, um, whether you're in the, the front of the, the monument or in the back. Um, so as you approach uh, the Memorial Plaza from the front, um, what you see is to, to your left, uh, the names of, of the 11 angels um, on the, the tallest wing um, and a representation of an angel um, on, on the, the smaller wing to the right uh, with Garden of 11 Angels uh, etched into um, the centerpiece and then um, on, on the, the, the bottom piece as well. Um, and on the back, uh, there is a scripture passage, uh, Psalm, uh, I believe that says 103 verse 20, um, as well as uh, an, an excerpt from a, a poem written by Maya Angelou, uh, And Still I Rise, uh, which uh, we received permission from Maya Angelou's estate um, to to have that that excerpt um, appear on the uh, on, on the memorial, um, and then finally uh, a, a picture of a rose uh, right right in the center to signify the garden itself. Um, and so the 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 lettering will be hand etched uh, based on this design into the, the black granite. Next slide, Scott. Okay, uh, this is just showing you the uh, aerial view of the monument itself. Uh, as you can see, the monument itself is a, a thin rectangular shape, and then the base that it sits on, uh, the base that it sits on was really kind of a combination of that slim rectangular base, as well as combining it with a, a, an ellipse uh, to pick up the shape of the plaza itself. And uh, as you can see, uh, it looks like it's uh, roughly around, uh, I can't even see that, uh, but it looks like it's a, roughly around nine feet by, doo -doo 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 -doo, I don't know, five feet or something like that. Next slide, please. And then we'll go back to the uh, a rendering of uh, 
the monument itself and what the the actual materials should look like in the material selection. Uh, what we're trying to do here is have this, this black granite pop off and be the centerpiece of this uh, memorial plaza at the top. Uh, we wanted it to, we want to have a base at the bottom and we went with a light color base and we're using or picking up the same color as the cap on the, the top of the seating wall. And we wanted that to be light. We wanted it, the monument itself to contrast and stand off. And we wanted to pick a base that would showcase the monument the best. Um, and I do believe, let's see, next slide, please. And it's a big question point, mark. <laughs> we, if, we will entertain questions. Uh, commission members. I move approval, Downing. I second. second. We have a motion second for the discussion. I just want to add, I think it, it's it's excellent. And um, as we said last time, thank you for all your incredible work on this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, Freddie, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you Looking very much. Thank you. Very good. Next mandatory referrals ordinance number 466 2021, uh, giving consent of the city of Cleveland to Cuyahoga. The county of Cuyahoga for resurfacing Ivanhoe Road. Who's here for this? Rick Swatowski. Hey, Rick, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the county will arrange for the preparation of construction plans and specifications, including engineering reports, and for the supervision, administration of the construction costs, and contribute 60% of the design costs and 80% of the eligible construction costs. The improvements include asphalt milling, pavement base repair, asphalt resurfacing, and installation of ADA compliant ramps over a distance of about 1.13 miles. This project was selected based on its poor pavement condition rating and to be part of the county's annual resurfacing program in 2022. The program goal is to improve pavement conditions on the county road system. Estimated cost is $1.6 million. Uh, the county will put in 1.259 million. The city will put in 348,000. Thank you, Rick. Uh, commission members. I move approval. Downing. Second, courage. We have a motion to second. Further discussion. Ready to call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Next is a resolution 486 2021 declaring the intent to vacate portions of Frankfurt Avenue Northwest extending from West 6th Street to West 3rd Street. Rick, you doing this one too? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Sure. Thank you. The Sherwin Williams Company is the owner of all the property abutting Frankfurt Avenue Northwest and intends to construct its new corporate headquarters on this property. The Sherwin Williams Company desires to vacate the portion of Franken Avenue from the east line of West 6th Street to the west line of West 3rd Street. And we have the consent of Councilman McCormick. Commission members. Move approval. Downing. Second, Curry. Uh, motion and second. Further discussion. Um, Mr. Chair, I must recuse myself. Okay. Thanks. Um, Freddie, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. I'm mean, sorry. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. We have an unnumbered ordinance to authorize the director of public safety to enter into purchase and lease back agreements with Cleveland Metropolitan School District 
for South High School located at 7415 Broadway Avenue. Um, who's here for this? And this is for a police training academy facility. Who's speaking to this one? Hi, good morning. My name is Susan Gordon. I work at Slavic Village Development, and I believe uh, I've worked closely with Councilman Brancatelli on this. I believe he's in a committee hearing, um, but the Slavic Village Development Corporation, as well as Councilman Tony Brancatelli, are in support of this. Thank you. Uh, and this is John Fosbender with the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects Division of Real Estate. Um, I'll be presenting this. I'm also joined by uh, my colleague, Suzanne DiGennaro. And um, we'll be making the presentation uh, on this project. Okay, go ahead. Um, this uh, this project involves the city acquiring and leasing back a portion of the South High School property uh, from the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Please, the next slide. Uh, South South High School is uh, located. Uh, off Broadway and Fleet between Osage and Marble Avenues. Next slide, please. Uh, here's some specifics about the South High School. It's a pretty large building, over 250,000 square feet. Um, it has uh, substantial facilities. I won't read through this specifically, but uh, a couple of key points. Um, one, the Stella Walsh Recreation Center is co located with South High School. Um, South High School was closed in 2010 and it hasn't been used. Uh, CMSC has only used a portion of the building since then. And finally, critically, South High School is an important is important to the city because of the significance to the neighborhood and its proximity to the rec center. Uh, I should say too that there has been a South High School at this location since the 1890s. Next wow. slide, please. Um, the city sees this as the Department of excuse me, the Department of Public Safety sees this as an opportunity. Um, for a badly needed training academy upgrade. Um, now, presently, and I'm gonna, there's a few, there's some information I'm gonna give you that's, a, that's not on this slide. I apologize, I, it's, uh, the, some information has been updated since we submitted this. But um, this training academy will be for not only police uh, training, but also for EMS and fire training as well. Um, presently, the police academy uh, classes are held in a few classrooms at the police headquarters on Ontario Avenue, EMS training is done in a few classrooms at the EMS headquarters on Lakeside Avenue, and fire classes are conducted at the Fire Training Academy in Lakeside Avenue as well. The Department of Public Safety wishes to develop South High School into an expanded, centralized public safety training academy for all of its safety divisions that hold division, um, safe police, uh, division safety classes on site, and it would accommodate cadet and youth vocational programs in partnership with CMSD. Now, these facilities, I mean, it's a, are ideal for police, uh, for, excuse me, for the public safety training academies. Um, there are ample classroom and other space for the, not only to recruit basic training, but also in-service training and uh, specialized training for all of the public safety divisions. Um, we should note, um, that the public safety uh, department anticipates uh, offering training and education to some of its regional public safety partners from this location as well. Um, these on-site facilities include gymnasium, weight room, locker rooms, indoor track, outdoor athletic field, which will not only provide ample space for a, a physical training associated with a public safety academy, but also other, other uses as well, other training as well. Plus there's an underground garage on the site um, for inclement weather training and, and also vehicle training and other similar training that can that can take place there. Next slide, please. Now, this project, we uh, the, the public safety department believes that it, it brings tangible benefits to the city and its residents. And I, and presently, uh, like other big city safety departments across the United States, the Department of Public Safety is struggling to recruit and retain qualified first responder candidates. Um, by locating in, in Slavic Village and forming partnerships with both CMSD and other community stakeholders, uh, the department can promote career opportunities in um, public safety and draw potential candidates from within the city's own neighborhoods. Uh, as part of this, uh, I noted a little bit earlier that CMSD and the city plan to collaborate on developing programs and, and curriculum 
uh, including instruction at the new uh, uh, Public Safety Training Academy at, at South High School to create career pathways into public safety. In fact, the classrooms being leased back to CMSD would be are anticipated to be used for that very purpose to provide public safety training to high schoolers uh, in connection with the police training academy. Other other benefits to the city that aren't uh, listed on this on this particular uh, slide. Uh, public works will be able to use South High School's uh, facilities for its recreational programming. It does now, but I think with with both uh, entities being used for uh, being under the city's umbrella, that would make it make it more uh, would make it easier. And also, the community will be able to use the facilities for community meetings and events. Next slide, please. Um, so what does the legislation, the proposed legislation, do? Well, first of all, it authorizes the Department of Public Safety to acquire uh, South High School from the from the school district. Um, it would immediately upon closing lease a portion of the building back to the school district for a 20 year term. Um, that that lease would include a small portion of the, of the facility, these 6 classrooms plus ancillary space. And during the 1st year uh, of that lease, the, um, the city would be making substantial improvements. Uh, to the to South High School, including renovations, energy concentration measures, uh, measures, and other measures necessary to improve functionality and reduce operating costs. Now, the district will give the city a credit against the purchase price of South High School, equal to the portion of the cost, the sort of pro rata portion of the cost uh, for the city's, or excuse me, for the school district's portion that 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 leased back space. Um, that benefits CMSD students. So we think that um, there'll be some cost savings in the purchase price there. Um, and I'm happy to understand any questions. Commission members. I move approval downing. Second. Go ahead. Okay, we have a motion in two seconds. Uh, further discussion. I guess my question: Who's who's responsible responsible for maintaining the building once it's repositioned? Is it the city, or is the school district going to be responsible for their piece of it? I believe the uh, the, the city would be responsible for um, maintaining and and operating the building um, once they own it. I believe that's okay. the case. Thank you. Call the question, please. Um, Freddie, call the roll. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yeah. yeah. Paul. Yes. And Slife. Yes. Take a look at the administrative approvals and I'll take a motion when you're ready. I move approval, Downing. Second. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Um, Southeast design review proposed demolition of a 2 story mixed use building seeking final approval. This is under codified ordinance 341 dash. Uh, 08 and it's located at 16626 miles Avenue. Who's here for this? Staff Richard Conti. Richard, are you on the phone? Let's hold this one off to the side and we'll come back to it. Uh, just a reminder, if you're on the uh, telephone, it's star six to unmute yourself. Thanks, Maurice. Richard? 
Near West Design Review uh, proposed demolition of a two-story mixed-use building, seeking final approval. Uh, this is also for uh, codified ordinance 341.08. 3329 Fulton Road. Who's here for this? Nora Bircher. Nora? Yes, Bashir. Bashir, okay. Um, my plans are to uh, demo the building. We had a fire. Back Who is this? I'm sorry, I missed your name. Uh, my name is Bashir Nora. Uh, Bashir, uh, I need to have you raise your right hand. Um, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? Yes. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. My plan is to uh, demo the building. We had a fire back uh, February 2nd of uh, 2021, and um, we've been in uh, business for over close to 40 years, and our plan is to demo the building and rebuild. And we have to uh, build a two-story outside dining. And uh, I don't know if Matt Matthew Moss is here. Um, he was the person that I spoke with. Okay. Yeah, looks like uh, Matthew has his hand raised, uh, Mr. Bone. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is uh, Matt Moss, neighborhood planner with the Planning Commission. The uh, uh, Mr. Nora submitted this uh, application for demolition. Uh, we had a, a site visit with the Near West Design Review Committee on June 22nd. Uh, some of the photos here are these are a mix of photos provided by uh, Mr. Nora and that uh, we took on our site visit. Uh, we visited the building to really get a sense of how extensive the fire damage was in the building to talk to Mr. Nora about his plans for the future and to just assess the condition of the building in order to make a recommendation. Based on our visit and the condition of the building and the damage, the extent to which this building was damaged by fire, the committee did uh, recommend de demolishing the building with just one condition that uh, the owner place a fence along the Fulton side, a temporary fence, while they ready their plans for a new building on the site, uh, just to prevent cut through traffic, cars using that curb cut to get around the light. Um, we think the, the committee does think that the, the, a new building on this site would present opportunities to better engage Fulton, close that curb cut, and do a slightly more active uh, use space than, than how it's currently configured. The building is uh, fairly historic, but just the, just the extent of the damage that we witnessed uh, on the site visit seems pretty extensive. So that was the recommendation from the committee. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Mr. Nor, uh, do you understand? Are you okay with putting up a fence? It seems for best safety, you need to. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, commission members. I move to approve. I second. We have a motion and second further discussion. Does the motion roll, please? Does the motion include the recommendation of the fence? Yes, I yes, I uh, didn't finish my motion, but yes. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Second. Okay. okay. Uh, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Hall. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Looking forward to the design. Thank you. Downtown Flats design review. Uh, this is for uh, post NFL draft improvements. Uh, this is at 101. Harryside Avenue. Who's here for this? John, who's here with the Department of Port Control. Hey, John. Go How ahead. You doing? Go so, ahead. Um, if you recall, back in the uh, early spring, uh, we uh, demolished the warehouses uh, north of First Energy Stadium in conjunction with the Sports Commission uh, for the staging of the NFL draft. Um, so what happened was uh, with those um, warehouses down, it kind of fundamentally altered um, the layout uh, of the parking lot there and uh, both created kind of security challenges and an opportunity to kind of temporarily expand it, expand parking capacity. 
uh, for larger special events. Um, so what we're here today is um, to, to seek approval to, to make those temporary improvements to maximize parking and um, alleviate any safety concerns until the property can be, um, you know, until the city is able to implement it, its long-term um, vision for the downtown lakefront. So uh, next slide, please. So this is um, the pre-draft conditions um, and how it was uh, laid out at the time was, and, it, and some of these uh, site improvements are still here. Is, uh, it's hard when you're not driving. Um, there, were, uh, There's a chain link fence around the perimeter of the, of the site. There's also a chain link fence on the uh, southern uh, end of the parking lot. Next slide, please. Um, and so when the warehouses were demoed, it, it prevented our ability, ability to kind of button off the site and prevent the public from getting to the um, north edge of, of, of the site. Um, next slide. Um, so what we're proposing here is um, a 430 foot um, chain link fence, uh, which it would be indicated in blue. And the value that gives to the site is that would allow us to keep uh, for day-to-day -day use a small portion of the parking lot, um, which we would use uh, is essentially the economy lot from North Coast Harbor. And uh, a small portion is um, where the valet parks uh, their cars for, for the restaurant down there. The other thing we would do, uh, we're proposing is uh, on the Northern end of the site where you, you see that line in, um, Red, we would propose to um, align uh, 80 uh, Jersey barriers, um, 12 feet in length, four, uh, separated by four feet. Um, and the benefit of this would to be prevent um, basically vehicles uh, from, from driving off the edge uh, when we have special events at, um, the, uh, at the stadium. Um, and then the areas bounded in yellow, those are the former uh, building pads uh, for the warehouses. They are, are now concrete. Um, we're proposing to skim coat those um, and, and then um, line, uh, line them for vehicle parking. And then in the middle, that, that orange box um, would be a uh, drive uh, path, which would be asphalted. We'd also add some uh, temporary lighting. And I just want to note, I, I know this is, is sort of a, a, you know, not the most detailed map and, and per the uh, excellent suggestion by uh, design uh, review team, uh, we're going to go ahead and um, uh, have an architectural site plan uh, prepared that would sort of detail these, uh, all these uh, modifications uh, for staff before we uh, submit for, um, you know, the formal permitting process. Next slide. And this is um, just kind of give you a sense of what the chain link fence would look like and, and what the Jersey barriers would look like. And um, we're also uh, proposing to um, re, uh, restripe all the existing um, parking spaces. They have faded um, just using the, the existing pattern that is out there. And with that, any, any questions? Yeah. Um, can we do something besides a Jersey barrier? That's kind of awful looking. How temporary is this? Um, I, I believe um, it would be, uh, I think we have to go back to per design reviews motion. We'd have to come back in a couple of years with, with a plan um, for a more permanent solution. Okay. Well, we, re I mean, we recognize as, as, you know, the department control and like the rest of the city, I mean, the highest and best use for this property is not a surface parking lot. We do not want to see it be a surface parking lot any longer than it has to be. till till the vision can be implemented. Commission members questions. Mr. Mr. Chairman, we had uh, Jack Bialowski had his hand raised. Go ahead, Jack. 
Good morning. Um, yesterday in design review, uh, when this was um, raised, uh, the committee's motion for approval of this, um, the initial request was for three years. Our recommendation was to approve this for two years. Um, this parking lot does not meet the city's own standards for parking lots. And what our suggestion to planning commission was uh, because of the exigency of the request and the uh, notion that there are a future development proposal coming through for this, that if such a proposal is not forthcoming for uh, concept approval to planning commission within a two year period that the city come back and improve this lot to its own standards. And the reason being, uh, it's just felt that this sets a bad precedent for others who might come with um, requests if the city doesn't meet its own requirements. So we moved uh, to approve it um, with uh, those contingencies on it. Thanks, Jack. I agree with you. Um, commission members. Yeah, August has his hand raised. I would I would like to echo Jack's sentiment and David's. Um, is that last time I checked, I think there's still Jersey barriers at Public Square, so uh, um, that would not look where well in my opinion. So I, I would like to move to to accept the proposal with the caveat that in two years, if there's no there's no development deal, then this area be brought to city standards as a parking lot. I'll second. We have a motion and second for their discussion. Roll, please. Bowen? Yes. Downing? Yes. Fluker? Yes. yes. Curry? Yes. Hall? Yes. Slife? Yes. Motion carries. Um, Thank Let's you. try to go back to. Thank you. Let's go back to uh, Southeast Design Review. Is uh, Richard on the phone? Conti? Richard? I'll take a mo motion to table this to next meeting. I move to table Downing. Second. Her. Motion second. Uh, call the roll, please. Hello? Bowling. Oh, hold, uh -oh. hold on, hold on. I'm here. Richard. You're here. <laughs> okay. I can't uh, wait. Just in the nick of time. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God. M Mr. Chair. I apologize. Mr. Chair, I, I move to remove the motion. Um, Thank you. From the table. Second. Thank you. I guess we need to call the roll. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Bounty. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. Okay, Richard, raise your right hand. Do you suddenly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. Go ahead, please. Um, this project, it breaks my heart to have to do this project uh, because I've loved this building for 50 years going past it. Um, but it's just, it w there was a fire, the um, buildings collapsed entirely on the inside and it's just not safe. Um, it has basically no roof, um, new, no roof structure. And it's, it's, it's dangerous to go in and out and it has to come down. We propose to do it according to the demo standards, take it down and backfill and seed and grass or grindings. Uh, is Mark on the phone? She is not. Okay. It was approved by design review. I mean, it's, it, it looks like it 
must have been a wonderful building, but it looks like it's in awful shape. Oh, it's awful. Um, commission members. I move approval. Second. Second. Go ahead, we have a motion second further discussion. Bowen. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Hurry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. Slash and carries. Uh, this is a special presentation of the townhouse code update. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, to commission members, as you know, uh, we've been uh, having dialogue about improvements to the townhouse code. Uh, we came before you uh, a few months back uh, with some modifications uh, to the code. Uh, since then, we've had uh, discussions with uh, some key uh, stakeholders. And we want to uh, present to you today uh, what those modifications are, uh, because we would like to continue to move this uh, townhouse code uh, update forward. Uh, so Kyle Reese uh, from planning staff uh, will walk you through uh, what those changes are, and uh, hopefully we can uh, reach a conclusion on advancing our townhouse code with said improvements. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair, to Mr. Collier. Before um, you begin, I, I would. Just like to know how many folks have been involved in this process and how diverse that looks in terms of um, in terms of the city's policies for, for diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Okay, uh, so with respect to the actual updates itself, um, from the time that we had the planning commission meeting, uh, we uh, had a conversation. Uh, with a couple of different entities, uh, AIA uh, being uh, representatives uh, from one of them. Um, you, you are also involved in that discussion. Um, that dialogue um, was very important uh, because it uh, actually tapped into the professional uh, community to get that input uh, from them. Um, we've been engaged with many development interests uh, over the course of this. Um, to get input on what the code needed to entail. Now, the uh, part of equity inclusion, I'm going to have to uh, just kind of throw that back at you with respect to uh, the city's goals for equity and inclusion and, and, and exactly sort of what you uh, uh, what you see um, uh, with respect to that, with respect to uh, engagement uh, around meeting our equity and inclusion goals. I just want to get some clarity from you. Um. I just, it, it, we all know, and I'm not here as to lecture. We all know when you include many different backgrounds, ethnicities, genders, um, ages, you know, I can go on and on, you get better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that as we navigate this rewrite and reworking, that that's represented so that this, this zoning code. Is, is is equitable across the city and not specific to uh, the areas that we've been laser focused on. That, mm -hmm. That's my concern. I just don't want us to just sort of try and fix things with a band aid based upon um, knee jerk reactions. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answers your question, Freddie. Thank you, sir. And just to uh, respond to that, and that's a, a fair question. Um, just with respect to the zoning code and all the updates that we do. Um, we've been uh, trying to be very, very uh, informative uh, and listen to community interests with respect to zoning altogether. Um, as you know, we're being very careful um, with edits to our zoning code. That includes the townhouse code. Um, our work in Huff is a great example of that. Um, a large portion of our zoning work has really been around educating uh, residents and also understanding the legacy of past policy. Um, much of what we're doing right now, Mr. Fluker, is really trying to course correct. Um, we all know the legacy of uh, past policies and how they disadvantage certain communities and advantage others. Uh, part of the reason why we're taking this geographic focus with this um, is really looking at, uh, you know, trying to create the type of communities that offer the diversity, not just in people, but in products um, in the type of, and create the type of conditions that's gonna actually create diversity. And I think that's evident um, in a lot of the work that we're doing. 
Now the townhouse code specifically, um, because it's so, uh, you know, kind of technical, um, when we've talked to individuals uh, in neighborhoods, um, it did take a lot of back and forth. And this townhouse code, along with form based zoning and other things that we're doing, uh, is all about that. So I just want to say, you know, I hope you all know that when it comes to equity include inclusion as a department, um, it's a it's a high value proposition for us, and we intend to continue to, you know, work to that vein whenever uh, it needs uh, conversation or exchange. So I just want to go on record saying that. Thank you, Freddie. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, okay. You know, we can talk, but as long as it's happening, that's what's important. Thank you, August. Okay, go ahead, Kyle. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, can you all see that? Yep. All right, I'm gonna make it full screen here. Um, so you guys have, uh, uh, good morning, uh, Kyle Reese from the Cleveland City Planning Commission. Um, here to update you on uh, some of the modifications that we're proposing to our, uh, our townhouse code. Um, the commission has seen this presentation before. It is slightly updated with some additional um, examples, uh, but it's essentially um, a, a, a very similar presentation to the one that was shown back in March of this year. Um, so I'm going to start with the goals of the update. Uh, we want to clarify some of the language and definitions uh, uh, in the code. Um, that's based on a user feedback from developers and architects who've used the code, as well as uh, a, a comments from the Planning Commission. Um, we're going to add some new definitions as they relate to auto courts, and we're going to uh, uh, modify the um, the use in a, two fam a single family or two family district. Right now, um, that uh, that question, uh, townhouses in the single or two family district um, is a little bit clunky. And so, uh, you know, as we've used the code, we've come up with a, we think we've come up with a better way to, to, to ask that question to the commission. So uh, we'll show you what that is. Um, so just a little bit of background again, uh, the code was originally adopted in 2018. Uh, we've had more than 25 townhouse projects um, completed or under development. Uh, this slide was from March, so um, there's even more now. Uh, and so far uh, in, in all that time, we've had zero uh, requests for variances from the townhouse code, which um, has really taken the burden off of the Board of Zoning Appeals and given a lot more clarity uh, to developers and residents. Um, so again, just some more background. Uh, this is a project uh, over on uh, Bridge Avenue uh, near West 58th Street. This was the type of development that was permitted by right uh, prior to the uh, townhouse code that we have today. Um, uh, so uh, I think we've made you know, some big improvements um, with our code and, and with development of townhouses so far as, as they relate to the city's walkability goals and sustainability goals. Um, this is another project. This is on Franklin Boulevard uh, near West 85th Street, uh, again, permitted by right prior to the townhouse code. Um, and, and so eliminating those front loaded garages and adding additional glazing and, and uh, stoops and uh, frontage features uh, are all part of the new code that wasn't in the old code. Um, again, uh, it just helps us advance our walkability and sustainability goals. Uh, this is an example of um, some new townhouses that are permitted uh, by right under the existing code, the one we have today. Um, these are on a uh, private frontage. Um, they have uh, Stoops, uh, lots of windows. Uh, there's windows on the on the on the side street um, that are uh, required by the code, um, and all the garages are on the alley in the rear. Um, this is another set of uh, townhouses that are um, permitted by right under our existing townhouse code. These are uh, these are over in um, Glenville, um, being built by Kinez. Um, they have front porches. Uh, you know, I think the design review body did a great job. Um, with the architecture, but the code uh, did a lot of the did a lot of the heavy lifting here uh, at the front end. Uh, another example of townhouses permitted by right under the existing code. These are at West 48th and uh, near Lorraine Avenue. Um, 
development. This is a set of townhouses that was built um, prior to the existing code uh, in the historic district on Franklin Boulevard near West uh, 50, 58th, I believe. Um, uh, one of the things that the code did, uh, does that we're, that we're pretty happy with is that it re, uh, reworks the zoning adjudication letters that developers get. So this was the zoning code review that was given to the developer um, when they went to build these townhouses. Um, and uh, this was the first time developer, uh, we had to really work with them to to get them to understand like what all this uh, what all this stuff was saying in here because you know it's just it's pretty it's pretty dense pretty hard to get through if you're not familiar with it and um, the funnier thing is that uh, all of the things in here uh, that are that were illegal under the old code um, are the things that make this townhouse great so um, it was stuff that the city wanted them to do but the code was telling them they couldn't do so um, so with the new code uh, this is the zoning adjudication that you'll get it's all in chart form all the requirements are here um, for all the different districts uh, and all the different um, categories of, of items that we're looking for so in the proposed column uh, if you can see my cursor here um, you know we review the, the set of plans that's been submitted um, and we say what you know what is in those plans and then uh, whether you're uh, conforming or non-conforming and what uh, what needs to be modified in order to get it uh, to conform if it's not. So it's really easy for developers to read and understand this new adjudication form. Um, people seem to be pretty happy with that. Uh, so the first new definition um, that we need to add to the pro uh, to the code is a townhouse project. Um, we have townhouse buildings and townhouse units as definitions. We'd like to add this definition of townhouse project. Um, this would allow for some number of single family units that are being submitted as a total package uh, to be included uh, in the townhouse code review. Um, the reason that we uh, need to do this, we believe, is that um, there are uh, a lot of instances where there's a set of townhouses um, that's being submitted and there may be a, a weird piece of land that's left over where you can add another single family house that's all part of a larger package um, that's all the same architecture and the same you know uh, style of of unit um, but it's just not attached with a firewall to another unit and um, and so to to kick that uh, single family house that's essentially the same as the townhouses into uh, a totally different um, zoning code review just doesn't make a lot of sense to us so the reason that we settled on this number of one third is that um, most of the time what we'll end up with is two townhouses and a single family that are all kind of, they all look the same. They're all the same developer, the same architect, all that, um, uh, but they just not attached with that firewall. So um, as long as you're under a one third, we, uh, we would hope to be able to review that as a, as a townhouse project. Um, give you a couple of examples. Um, this is a, a project that's under construction. Um, actually, I think these might be done now uh, over on West 20th in Duck Island. Um, and as you can see, uh, we're looking at these ones that are uh, in, the, in the blue box here. Um, there are two uh, sets of, of single or of, uh, of townhouses. So these units were reviewed under the townhouse code. Um, and this unit here, which is identical in architecture and, and format, um, would have been kicked into a different zoning code review entirely. Uh, even though you can see in the images here, and this is the unit uh, right here to the left, um, it's all one project. Um, here's another one. Um, so these units, uh, this is on uh, uh, West uh, 58th um, and Detroit is up here to the north, uh, Franklin Boulevard to the south. Actually, those townhouses that we just looked at, they're on this site here. Um, so these townhouses uh, reviewed under the townhouse code. These townhouses would be reviewed under the townhouse code, but this single family back here, which is the same architect, same developer, um, same architecture style uh, would have been kicked into a totally different zoning code review than, than everything else here. So it just makes the project, it just makes doing these reviews a lot more difficult if we have to do that. If we can just add this unit into the townhouse code review, um, we can move these projects through a lot faster and with a lot more um, clarity for the developer. Um, uh, so it just makes sense to us to do that. Um, these are what those units look like. Um, so that's the, that's the first definition. Um, the second definition we'd like to add is for auto court. Um, the, there's, been a, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in a bunch of the neighborhoods and with the planning commission about um, improving the space where the, the cars are on these projects. 
And so in order to uh, add regulations to those spaces, we need a definition um, so that we can so we can regulate that space. So um, we're requesting to add uh, the definition of an auto court uh, to the code itself. And so really what this do, will do is um, just define uh, any of the areas in gray here as auto court until we can add regulations um, to to what happens in that in that area shaded in gray there. Um, just another example, another auto court. So everything in gray here would now be defined as auto courts, and we could add regulations uh, to that. Uh, and so, uh, what those regulations are um, is a landscaping requirement for uh, for those auto courts. Uh, so, uh, for every 32 linear feet of garage door, uh, you're, that's visible from the right of, right of way, um, and we're not including alleys in that definition. Um, you're going to be required 25 square feet of landscaping in that auto court. And the way that we're going to do that calculation is that we'll, um, if we're able to draw a direct line from the, the right of way to that garage door, then that is that linear footage of that garage door is going to be counted towards the 32 feet. Um, these green bars here are garage doors that are not directly visible from the right of way, so those uh, linear feet of garage doors will not count towards that calculation. Um, so that will just be part of the zoning review that we'll we'll do uh, here in city planning on those. Um, so uh, so if we're looking at this one, there's seven 16 foot garage doors, so it's 112 uh, linear feet of visible door. Um, you divide that by 32, and we round up uh, to the first whole number. We end up with 100 square feet of landscaping that that would be required in uh, in this auto court. Um, you don't have to do that in 25 foot uh, square foot increments. You can do it anywhere it makes sense. Um, in, in any, uh, you know, you don't have to do it in the 25 foot increments. You can do it anywhere in any amount, but you just have to get to the total of, of 100 square feet uh, inside the auto court. Um, and so, uh, just kind of some examples of, of what it looks like uh, without that landscaping. Um, when those auto courts are directly visible from the street, you can see there. Um, they're just not as pleasant uh, to look at or to walk past. And, and that is really the point is that um, we're only regulating these auto courts when you're walking past them on the public right of way and they're visible from the public right of way. So if this was off of an alley or an internal court, um, you wouldn't have to uh, apply that, uh, that rule. But, um, but if you are visible from the public right of way, then, then we're gonna ask you to do that. Um, this is Battery Park. Um, this is the Avenues. Uh, this is Tremont Black, um, all examples from Cleveland. Um, uh, this top picture here and this uh, bottom right picture here, um, examples from Chicago of some pretty cool auto courts. Um, this middle picture here is uh, is on Larchmere. Uh, I know they modified this recently, but it's still a pretty good auto court. Um, uh, second uh, regulation that we're going to add is a paving material. So it's the same idea here. If you're visible from the right of way. Uh, you're going to have to have 60% of the surface area of your auto court uh, paved with human scale materials. Um, human scale materials uh, are uh, defined in the townhouse code already. Um, but basically what we'll be asking people to do is to use brick pavers or um, stamped concrete, something that's um, not asphalt or just, uh, just white concrete, um, something that's a lot more uh, rich in its, its visual characteristics. Um, so when you start adding up the landscaping and the and the pavement, uh, the changes in the materials and the pavement, um, you start to get auto courts that are, are a lot more interesting. Um, they feel like places that might be shared. So uh, pedestrians, I, I think, as well as cars, um, would be just as comfortable in this space. Um, it, it feels like a shared space, and that's really the the feeling uh, that we're going for um, in these auto courts if they're visible from the street. And so uh, we do have an example. Uh, of a townhouse code or a townhouse project. Uh, this is in Little Italy. Uh, the developer um, uh, was willing to meet the, the new requirements of the townhouse code. Um, so these ones that we just talked about uh, voluntarily, uh, I worked with them um, and Landmarks uh, worked with them to uh, to come up with the, the changes and the design of this project um, that meet all of the things that we're proposing to do in this new townhouse uh, modifi modified townhouse code. Uh, and I personally think it, it came out came out pretty good. Um, so uh, so some things that it's doing from the, the regulations that we already have. So um, 
this front facing unit has its primary door uh, facing the street. It's got a large covered porch, a uh, nice set of stairs. Um, it does have the driveway coming straight from the primary street. Um, so the street screen is required um, and they've used it as uh, kind of the mailbox area here. Um, and there's additional landscaping in front of it. Um, uh, so here's the site plan. You can see that they're paving 60% of the material, uh, the surface area of the auto court. Uh, they're going to be actually using brick pavers. Um, and then uh, as you uh, uh, enter your unit, um, those brick pavers will continue. So it's kind of a visual uh, draw from the, the way that you would walk to these units into the individual door. So you can see even from the right of way where, you know, where each individual door uh, is, which is, is pretty cool. Again, um, the street screen is right here with additional landscaping in front of it, hiding a couple of uh, 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 air conditioner condensers, um, large front porch, nice nice set of stairs. Um, I think this project uh, uh, you know, turned out really well. You can see all the additional landscaping um, that ended up in the, in, the, in the auto court that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So they do meet their requirements for, um, for the landscaping, the 25 uh, square feet per individual door that's visible. So. Um, so it, you know, we asked the developer to help us see if it works. Um, they volunteered to, to do it voluntarily uh, and they had no issues uh, meeting the requirements. Um, so I think, uh, I think what we've done here um, is pretty good. Um, uh, this is probably the most important piece that we're, uh, we're modifying though. Um, this is the townhouse in the two family district. Um, I think we all know that uh, this one's been um, challenging uh, in the past to, um, to understand. And, and uh, I guess I take this moment to apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> we, we tried our best on that first round, but you don't always get it right the first time. So we're gonna come back and, and hopefully make it much more clear this time. Um, so right now, uh, townhouses are not permitted by right in the single or two family district. Um, you do need uh, a conditional use from the planning commission to do that. And what that conditional you know, use is generally is uh, that um, you're uh, being compatible with your neighborhood and, and the surrounding context. Um, but the way that we had structured that language, it wasn't entirely clear. So um, so the way that it works right now is uh, so that uh, if you're in the single or two family district, you do need the city planning commission to approve it. If you're uh, above that, so in the multifamily or above, um, townhouses are permitted by right. You just need to uh, get your designer view from the appropriate body and 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 meet the zoning code. Um, the issue that we were having here was that um, the, it, it, the code says that the planning commission has to give the appropriateness um, uh, designation, which which would allow it to move forward. Um, but in in a lot of instances, the uh, Landmarks Commission was actually doing the design review, and so um, so they would have to go both to Landmarks for design review, and then come to Planning Commission for their conditional approval um, for the use of the townhouse in the single or two family district. Um, we'd like to modify that so that if Planning Commission is is giving the approval, the Planning Commission uh, will have the authority to uh, to grant the the conditional use. If Landmarks is doing the design review, then landmarks will grant the uh, conditional use. Um, we just think that makes it clearer, uh, cleaner, um, and it, it doesn't subject the developer to additional uh, meetings that, um, you know, if, if the Landmarks Commission has approved it, uh, it seems like the Landmarks Commission is okay with it. They shouldn't have to come to the Planning Commission for that, for that conditional use, uh, in our opinion. Um, so uh, here are all the items that were part of the conditional use. So these were the things that um, we thought the Planning Commission uh, should be looking at if they're going to approve a, a, a townhouse in a single or two family district. There's a lot of stuff in here. And really all it is, is um, the things that we couldn't codify. It's, it's, those, it's those things that need a human to, to review and, and you know, give input on. Um, but there is a lot of stuff here, and uh, and so what we wanted to do is just make it much cleaner on what the what the planning commission or or if this is adopted, the landmarks commission is actually looking for when they're approving that use in the two family or single family district. Um, and so uh, so this is what we're proposing to change it to, um, and I think this is really important for the commission to understand. Um, so townhouses in a single or two family district. Uh, or any district where they're not permitted, 
Um, the applicable design review body, i.e. the planning commissioner landmark, shall determine based on the application of subsection one division E of this section, which is above, um, if a townhouse uh, use shall be permitted. And these are the things that we want you guys to look at. So um, it's basically just a checklist. Um, so if the develop, so the development shall be consistent or complementary to nearby properties with respect to the following elements: height, front yard setback, roof form, and frontage feature. These things are the items that we think most determine whether a new set of townhouses is going to be compatible with its uh, with its context. Um, these are things that do not have specific requirements in the townhouse code. So, for instance, uh, height. Um, uh, you may be permitted to go up to 35 feet, but we're going to give the Landmarks Commission or the Planning Commission uh, the ability to say, well, 35 feet is actually out of context uh, for this for this neighborhood and this project. So uh, the commissions would have the ability to lower that to 28 feet or 26 feet or 32 feet, whatever, whatever it happens to be. Um, the front yard setback, again, we set ranges in the RA 1, 2, and 3 district. Um, but the Planning Commission or the Landmarks Commission would now have the authority to say, yes, the code allows you to go to zero, but in order to be compatible, you really need to be at six or at eight or 12, whatever that number is. Uh, roof form, we don't talk about at all uh, in the regulation. So, you know, if there's a, um, a mono pitch roof or a, a flat roof or a gable roof, um, the Planning Commission is going to be able to now say, well, we think that you know one or the other of these is, is it makes the project more compatible, and we we need you to do that in order to give you this conditional uh, uh, use approval. Um, and then the same as the frontage feature. You know, if there's if it's very common for uh, a block to have porches on it, and the developer is proposing um, a, a, some sort of center court or a um, a stoop. Uh, the commissions would be able to say, well, porches are more prominent on this block. Uh, we really like you to do porches and you're going to have to do that in order to get our approval. Um, so those are the, those are the things that we, we think will make uh, the process much more clear for the developer and um, the planning commission on exactly what they're supposed to be looking at when they're given this, uh, when they're, when they're asked to give this um, approval. Uh, so on height, um, these are just kind of some examples of, uh, I wanted to show, you know, to talk about, you know, how the height can be modified in different ways. So I know a lot of townhouses want to do the three stories, um, but maybe along the, the sidewalk, um, you know, two stories is more appropriate. There are ways to get that additional height um, while still kind of keeping the, with in with the context. And, and the Planning Commission with, or the Landmarks Commission would now be within their authority to ask for something, you know, like this instead of a, a full three story um, building right on the sidewalk. Uh, front yard setback. Um, so again, these are some examples. Uh, three stories. Um, they have about uh, a ten foot setback. Um, maybe if these were at zero, they would be, you know, pretty imposing. Um, but maybe at ten feet or twelve feet, uh, at six feet, they they would be okay. So now it's now it's in the planning commission or landmarks commission's authority to to modify that front yard setback. Uh, roof form. Um, you know, there's just there's different contexts, and so different um, different contexts require. Uh, that input from the commissions and, and you can modify a uh, roof form to make things feel taller or shorter. Um, the commission will now have the ability to, to, to tell the developer to do that if they want this approval. And, uh, and same thing with, um, uh, with the frontage features. Um, this is a set of uh, historic townhouses that were rehabbed uh, on uh, Clinton. Um, if somebody wanted to build new townhouses next door to it, um, that you know, we're very close to the street with stoops, um, you know, the commissions would now have the ability to modify that front yard setback and the and the, um, the roof pitch, uh, the roof form, uh, the frontage feature, all those types of things. And just kind of, uh, I know there were some questions last time about exactly what those frontage feature uh, options are. Um, this is from the code. Um, so the, the different districts, the RA one, two, and three districts, um, tell you which. Uh, which frontage features are appropriate in those districts, and you, have, you can select any of those. Um, and here's uh, here's what they are. So this is directly from uh, the existing townhouse code. And just a couple of examples of uh, of some used units. Um, private frontage uh, features. So even if you're on a private frontage, um, which is a right uh, a frontage 
that doesn't have uh, a right away on it, um, the ability to to do all of those things is still given to the planning commission or the landmarks commission in this modified code. Um, so those are the those are the updates that um, we think will make the code uh, work better. Um, uh, will be clear for developers um, and and the commission and what we're asking for uh, in that single or two family district approval. So I'll be happy to take any questions um, from from the commission. Well, and, and Jack, you can ask questions too. I know you spent a lot of time with us and staff on this too. So I'll open it up to Jack also. So go ahead, commission members. Yeah. Um I for to Mr. Reese, uh, Mr. Chair to Mr. Reese. Um my I didn't hear anything explaining how one would go about designing um townhouses on a corner. For example, um if the, you know is there a way cuz again I'm not a zoning person. Is there a way to write the code that that primary frontage needs to wrap the corner so we don't have ends of buildings? staring to a courtyard it's naturally one thing to have a mid block scenario which i think is easy to resolve but on corners we it's a very tough proposition as you know thanks um yeah so there is a minimum uh depth requirement for townhouses um it's i, I don't think i have anything in this presentation that, that shows that uh, that section of the code but um yeah, there is a minimum depth requirement. So you do have to wrap the corner. There's uh, minimum uh, setbacks from that secondary street. Um, but the issue, I, uh, at least in my experience, has been on corners is that the um, that behind the townhouse is that there's visible uh, there's visible garages, and so uh, those auto courts are you know not always the most pleasant thing to look at if they're not well designed. And so this code modification will will require that those auto courts have all the landscaping and the, and the pave, pavement materials those types of things um there's also in the code on, on a secondary street there's minimum window requirements so you have to have a certain amount of glazing um on the first floor uh, you have to have human scale materials on the building itself uh, on the um so like you know flap siding brick you can't have these big uh, monolithic panels that don't have any texture to them um, because we want to make sure as you're walking down the street that it's an interesting walk. And so adding windows and, and uh, besides the texture, those types of things help help to do that. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Um, Al, uh, Al, could you go back a couple of slides? Because I want to really get to the heart of what um, Mr. Fluker just raised, uh, because that was the one issue that we were facing over uh, in the Ohio City neighborhood that would come up all the time. Uh, keep going back. I'll tell you when to stop. It's the example of the uh, auto court images that you showed. Keep going. There are multiple images on one slide. Keep going. Uh, there we go. So um, I think it was with Tremont Black was one of those uh, uh, developments where you had this situation where you had um, the units fighting on the street. And then when you got to the corner, you immediately saw the drive aisle, and then there was another row. And uh, one of the, the concerns was when you turn the corner, you would immediately see this auto court scenario, and it would be at a corner unit. And the question I think is basically uh, what would be the way in which to solve for that? Like, so for example, Larchmere is obviously Main Street mid block sort of scenario. Um, but when you're at a corner scenario, uh, that becomes a lot more problematic visually for some. And if I'm understanding you correctly, Mr. Fluker, that's that's really what the the heart of that question was with respect to those corners. Yes, I mean, I we just we, well, my company, well, might not company anymore, but um, we would always turn so that there's a unit facing the side street, so mm -hmm. it's not just the side of a building, but there is a, a unit. Again, I'm not saying that it's doable in every case, but I think there should be some consideration to sort of flipping things so that maybe you enter in off the main street and not on the corner. So there's there's ways to do it and maybe you lose a little bit of density, but I just, just wanna make sure that we can help navigate that. And I guess that starts with design and Kyle and you guys working with the developers before it gets to us. Because we don't want to try and solve those problems when it gets to planning. I guess that's that's my point. Thanks, Freddie. You did articulate that well. 
thing. Because I, I know yeah, and he heard you loud and clear. I think it was yeah, that's difficult to codify. And I think you just said it. You know, um, it's really the ability of the or the competence of the uh, the reviewers and the design professionals who govern design review to be able to be sensitive to that when that scenario comes up. Yeah, and I think I think there's two things. I think there's this uh, the code itself, and then there's the design review aspect. Once we find that by code, they, what they want to do is appropriate. They still have to come through design review, and it has to be designed appropriately for that neighborhood. Now, of course, by code, we can say what they're presenting isn't appropriate for the neighborhood, and that they have to come back with a different design of the townhouses. And I think that's what the goal of this exercise has been, is to not let something that is inappropriate even get to design review. Yeah. Um, this is Lillian. Um, I, have, um, I have a sort of something I want just a clarification on, and then I have one suggestion. So, um, first of all, Kyle, I really want to thank you for, um, I think this work is excellent. I think you've had a lot of, um, you know, spirited and very different points of view coming about this. So, I really want to commend you for the work and for making the changes that I think are necessary. And I do think this is really um, kind of evolving the townhouse code and learning from what worked and what didn't work. Um, but so, I just want to sort of say from my perspective, just having seen these numbers come in, there have been some pain points and I think what you put forward addresses some of the pain points we've seen. My first clarification has to do with the first major pain point that I have seen from the community, which is this question of density, right? And, and what sometimes is packing in as much density to the detriment of the adjacent neighborhood neighbors. So that pain point you kind of address in the last um you know, uh, change around the conditional use at the time of design, either at landmarks or planning. So the clarification that I want to ask is, is there now a specific requirement that neither the planning commission or the landmark commission will approve the conditional use without the full design? Because I think the pain point came for us when we were asked to approve a site plan for conditional use prior to actually seeing the, that full design. So I just want to clarify that that is what you meant by it, that they, you, we cannot approve the townhouse conditional use without the design. Before I ask my second question. Yeah, that is the intent. It is a process question and, and the code, uh, the townhouse code itself does not have process built into it. Um, uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it would have to be just an internal, um, decision that's made, but, but because we've modified what those things are that the planning commission is looking at to be so specific, I'm not quite sure how you would get to be able to answer those questions without having, you know, an almost fully vetted, uh, project. But it happened. We saw it, Kyle. So we were asked to approve the site plan or the density without it before, even though that because it wasn't clear, right? So I'm just asking you if there's just a way to clarify that to the applicants so that we did just a little more to, to make that clear that we're not going to give you the density and then you come back with the design or, you know, until you've resolved those community issues, because honestly, that was where I think the community really had a lot of, you know, there became a lot of issues with, with that. So I would say if there's a way, Kyle, to just clarify that in process or in the ordinance in some way that makes clear that, um, that one, you know, because what happened was people were like, oh, well, I got this conditional use proven. So as of right, you can't now tell me not to do that. So, so I, I don't know what the answer is, but I yeah. just ask you to try that a little bit more clearly because that's where we got in trouble with the community, I think. Um, I, and I fully understand and hear you. Uh, uh, we will, we'll see if we can, we'll see if we can come up with something for that. Okay. 
And and I, I think that that um, I think you're right. It'd be hard to prove it without with what you said. That's categories. But remember, that's where we were prior. And you know, I think August kept asking that question, right? And we couldn't get the answer. So that would be one that I think would really strengthen it and be clear. It's just about clarity. So developers know, we know, you we have to see it in full. And so, um, so there's that. My second one is. Um, is that um, has to do with, as you know, my particular issue with the misuse of Muse. So, um, so, and I don't mean from your perspective. I mean the the design or the the developers misusing the term Muse and the idea of a Muse. So here's the suggestion, if it's possible, would be to actually in the auto port section, not in the last section to deal with Muse. So what I would like to see if the world was perfect was um, the definition of a Muse defined in the auto port section, because here's what I'd like to see is that if you're doing a long Muse to, to enter your units, those long rows of them, and they're is really, you know, as you know, either unsafe or up against railroad tracks or whatever, then I think there should be a requirement of a man door in the auto port. And I think that specific thing should be stated. So if 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 there is no frontage and you're using long muse, then we should require an additional man door in the auto port. That's a great suggestion. And it's very simple, and I think it belongs in that section, not at the end, because I think that would create the examples you showed of the ones that were wonderful, had the change of payment, the landscaping, and the doors. And actually, that is the little Italy new example, which I saw at, in the neighborhood, which I think is phenomenal, even is it's kind of a hybrid, but it, it's really how you would want it to be. So can we add that kind of muse language in and define muse and clarify so we don't get those a long stretch of units in the back with no man doors on the auto court yeah um i i would have to think about how we would do that you know if it's a total if it's the number of units that are um that are attached um or uh you know, it's a linear distance of units. Um, I'm, not sh I'm not sure the best way to do that, but uh, or, I mean, yeah, we could come if, up with some threshold. Yeah. So if we if we'd use that unit example, if you go to the the you show it the one in Glenville that I don't like. So if you can go to that site plan, I could show you how you could use that unit, like that number of units on a muse. So that's the one that really bothers me, right? So you have no man doors. The muse is tiny, and it's right up against the railroad tracks. So this would be one that I would say, if you're going to do that muse, you should be required to have a man door on the auto court. And the length is part of what does bother me, Kyle. So if we could, I would care less if it was just the part that wrapped around with the shared green space, you know, but uh -huh. the fact that the last unit there has no man door and has to walk that entire length to get home or a visitor to come really bothers me. Yeah, Mr. I mean, Chairman. Uh, this is, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Jack. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you're done with this notion, but I have something that wants to add on to it. Um, when you're ready, Kyle, if you want to respond, go ahead, and then I'll come back. Oh well, it's uh, it's probably not um it's probably not all that relevant, but uh, those last two units on the left side did end up getting eliminated from the final plan, so. Um, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't code required, but just Lillian, just so you know, they did get eliminated. So, <laughs> um, so is it the, is it the total length, um, that's, that is your concern or is it the number of units? Because, um, the number of units that are attached is, is, is only three. No, it's not the number of units. It's the length of which. So if I'm coming to visit this, if I'm coming to visit this person who lives in any of those units, right? I'm a visitor. Uh -huh. I either have to come through their garage door or I have to walk all the way along. There's no front door, right? And in, I'm arguing that in this instance, instance, if you had a wonderful muse, I'd rather have a front door on the muse. And so I'd rather require it. 
So, so Kyle, I, I think I see what she's saying too. It makes a lot of sense. So if if you're coming down Wade Park and you want to go into the back corner unit, I guess you could walk all the way through and around, but it would be a nice processional if you had a choice of uh, coming off the auto court, which is now going to be nicer, or through the front door. It's also going to uh, reduce density a little bit as well. Yes. Lillian's point is that if that auto court is attractive, it's not an issue. And if that man door is there, then you don't feel like you're in a wasteland. Yes. Okay. And and Jack, your point is really well taken. And then it it naturally forces a little bit less density and more quality of life. Just by the nature that you probably have to widen the unit a little bit to put yes. a man door in there, which was always the pain point there. So it's not a huge change, but for me, it's a really important one that also leverages the beauty of a of an auto court and what it was intended for. So I yeah. think we can work on it. With structure, with structure, it's at least five feet. So yes. I think that's probably a great idea. Kyle, I I want to also commend you and Freddie for listening to um, you know all the multifaceted voices um, that you heard in coming back and being open. To the modifications, and I think you have done a really good job of synthesizing and solving a number of the problems that were raised, certainly in the AIA zoning task force. Um, there, there are two things that I would like to um, bring up relative to this. One of them relates to the issue of side loaded muses as well. Um, the fact that the landmarks or design review is now mandated and that um, it can determine appropriateness. Um, I, I still personally believe in the side loaded units, but I think that the minimum uh, uh, thresholds for landscaping and um, those setbacks from the sides that you have established do not allow for appropriate or do not mandate appropriate landscaping and would like to see those um, increased. Um, the other issue um, relative to this, that is, I'm not sure how is addressed. Um, these are interventions when they happen in a single family neighborhood. And I don't know that there is provision for notification of the neighbors that the design review bodies are actually going to be hearing uh, what's going on. And there are a number of cases where these things have a big impact on neighborhoods. I think you've done a lot in the way of addressing the concerns of the neighbors by the modifications that you have made. And we do trust to the um, you know, professionalism of the design review bodies, but um, I think there should be some notification of someone, if there's a single family home that is going to be adjacent to a side loaded muse, those folks really ought to be able to hear what is being talked about and to see it before it lands in their yard. And the last point that I want to ask about um, relates to um, the line about uh, not being able to, uh, cannot mandate good architecture. Um, is that still in the code? Because I think you should be silent about it rather than uh, stating it. And it is, of course, the job of design review landmarks or a planning commission to um, make appropriate architecture. Um, whether that is, you know, the notion of good architecture, I think, is is not something that should be discussed, but it certainly shouldn't be discouraged. And leaving language like that in the code. Uh, I think gives room for um, for people to quibble and to um, you know take issue with decisions that design review or landmarks might make or planning commission. Thank you. Sure. So uh, I'll start. Uh, thanks, Jack. I, I appreciate all the comments. Um, and Lillian. Um, yeah. So the the so the first comment about the um, the depth of the muse units right now the the requirement is. Seven feet. Um, I think we've been talking about increasing that to ten feet, uh, and there's that's that's a very simple change. We just modify the number um, for that provision. So I, I don't I don't have any issue doing that. I think that's probably the right thing to do. I think seven probably was a little bit too narrow. 
um, if there's going to be uh, landscaping and a frontage feature on that uh, on that on that private frontage. So um, I was I was leaning towards changing that to ten. Um, and as to the architecture, um, the uh, there is no. Um, the, uh, Maurice, I don't know if you could go back to the original um, uh, language that we had in there for uh, for um, the conditional use. I think it, it might be further down, not up. keep going so th so this language so this is the language that was in um, is in the code today that talks about what the planning commission should look at for conditional use approval um, and there were uh, there is a bunch of language in here about you know how we are or how the planning commission is supposed to um, the things that they're supposed to look at to do that but, so this did talk a lot about architecture uh, in it so there's nothing in here that says we are, we're asking you for bad architecture, <laughs> uh, but um, if you go to the next slide, Maurice, we fully removed, um, uh, maybe the next one, keep going. Yeah, this one here, we fully removed all of that language that talked about architecture. So there's nothing in here that says, you know, you should be, um, you know, historically appropriate or you should be doing modern architecture anywhere. There's none of that is in here anymore. It's, that is then completely left up to the design review body to determine what is appropriate architecture. It's the planning commission or the landmarks commission's job now to just look at these things for, um, for compatibility. So it's not, it's when you're approving the use, it's these things. When you're approving the design, you're actually looking at the architecture and the recommendations from the um, from the design review committees. So I, I that's, that's separate excellent. those two things out. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a good clarification, and I think that will solve a bunch of issues. Can um, you address Kyle? I think I, I really appreciate um, Jack's question about process. It was one of the other big pain points. So his point about these are significant projects, and even though you're trying to streamline the process, there's no notification. So, can um, I respond to that, please? Yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> right. So, there's a uh, obviously, you know, when we do zoning, for example, uh, we have to send out uh, notifications uh, to property owners that are proximal to the actual zoning change. Um, if that is extended. Uh, to uh, design review projects like this, um, the capacity is always a question. You know, you all know that we are often asked to do uh, more with less, and it could be a challenge. And um, will it make sense? We think that it probably would make some sense. Uh, the only thing that I would be concerned about, Lillian, is being able to do that and do it efficiently and making sure that we have the capacity to do it. Uh, I think that's the concern um, from an administrative end. And you'll see that in the next uh, sort of pr uh, presentation on you know, how we have to uh, be uh, efficient and, and, and also be lean. Uh, so we have to be very thoughtful with respect to how we go about that, if in fact we can pull that off. But I hear you about the notifications to neighbors because they are impactful projects. But uh, with the zoning uh, piece of it, you know, when we send out the notifications for zoning matters, there's a you know a definite concern that residents' property values and things are impacted, and they they kind of get that. I don't know necessarily that they understand that with the, the design review uh, type of uh, projects, but I think it's something that we could mature into. I just don't know if it can be executed at, at this particular uh, point. And I'm not making excuses. It's just, you know, that's the reality of it. There has to be a commitment, you know, by uh, an administration <laughs> uh, to wanting to make sure that we have the capacity to deliver on that. I have a suggestion for that, um, Director Collier, which is that this does not need to be at the same level and standard of the zoning uh, you know, which affects an entire neighborhood in this instance, um, if 
if just the immediate neighbor who is, you know, has a direct impact of light and shadow or people looking into his backyard, even just, you know, the one or two people who are immediately affected by a project are notified that there is going to be a hearing at design review. I think that would be sufficient um, in under these circumstances, and that probably wouldn't be too onerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, Jack, you're talking about an abbreviated parcel. Yeah, I agree with Jack. Just a contiguous parcel mm -hmm. to any townhouse development mm -hmm. be notified. Yeah, so I'm thinking, like, uh, I know when the, the zoning notifications go out, we use that, uh, we use the uh, Metro Scan, uh, which captures addresses in a certain geography. So, we would just need to think about uh, sort of like if there's a project. And those impacts, you know, are realized for those neighbors, you know, making sure that you do the task of identifying those neighbors, getting those addresses, seeing out some type of formal, you know, uh, no notification to them. So we don't not agree. It's just that I'm thinking from an administrator standpoint, how that transaction happens. And once you start that, you can't miss that. You know, when we've missed like a, a you, you have errors where you may, uh, uh, somebody may not get a notification Lillian, for a, uh, a zoning change and it's like the world is falling apart, you know, so we don't want to be in that position. You know, we want to be able to, to effectively deliver on that. So let us chew on how we can just make sure that it's actually being executed. Hey, Freddie. Yeah, if I could yeah. ask a question. Sure. Take, take a look at the uh, county GIS map, and then th they could just kind of pull up who the contiguous property owners are, and they have their contact information in there too. Okay. So the the process that we that we use for notifying on BZA um, would be the same process that we would have to go through for this, whether we were notifying in a 500 foot radius or uh, or just contiguous neighbors. Um, something that uh, Maurice Rollins and I have kind of been kicking around for a couple of years and that a lot of other cities do is they just put a project sign out on the property. Um, that uh, that might be, um, I think in my view, that would probably be uh, cheaper in the long run um, and and probably more efficient for staff. Uh, you know, we go out for BZA to take photographs. We're already out in the field. We could just add um, adding the project sign to that. Um, so we could we could talk to the sign shop about what that might look like if we could get one or a couple of signs that um, are sturdier that we could reuse time and time again, or whether we would get paper ones that um, that could uh, we would just print every time. I'm not sure, but um, you would have I just to, want to throw that out there as an option. It's a good thought, Kyle, um, and you would have to print because you're going to make people aware that there is going to be a hearing at some point, right? Well, we would probably just have the sign direct them to the to the um, to the planning commission page where the agendas are. Yeah, I see. I'm not I'm not sure how it would work, but yeah. Well, I, it's good to see that you are thinking about how you might solve this issue, and I really appreciate that you're open to it. I try to open up a can of worms because I often do that. Um, I've been to your point, Kyle. I've been in Toronto. I've been around the country and, and out of the country. Most communities, most cities post signs and they, they identify what type of zoning, they give you all the information that's that's so that they understand what's going on, what are the parking capacities are. Very helpful. It tells you what's going on. There's not just the developer's name up there. There's some value when, when those signs get created. So I just, as a thought, put a pin in it. We can move on. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. What are we approving today? Are we just giving feedback to Kyle and, and now there will be some thinking? I mean, there are obviously three things we've identified just for a little more work. One with the idea of notice. Um, the second is potentially some statement about uh, Mandors and Muse, if they're, uh, that might make sense. And then I think the third isn't a hard one, but just a little bit more clarification on beefing up the notion that when you're coming in for conditional use, you have full design. Those for me are so far the three things, but what what are we asking for today? And do we have time to think about those three things? Yeah, so what we're asking for today is approval of the items that have been presented. Um, 
given the fact that these there's these additional three items uh, that we want to look at, uh, we obviously uh, need to uh, come back with the uh, response to those uh, three items. But we want to be able to move forward with the actual uh, uh, recommendations that you see today, uh, which everyone seems to be okay with with respect to uh, the overall code. But these the three things that you highlighted, um, one of which we need to make sure uh, that we can actually codify it. And the one is the recommendation, Lillian, about the Muse uh, feature yeah. example that you gave. So making sure that we can actually codify that. Yeah, it makes sense, but is that a design item or is that something we can actually codify? So that's the question that I, I don't know that answer, but that's something we need to, to figure out. And then uh, the yeah. next issue I think is, uh, that's, that's a, I think that's more of a process thing. I think we can, you know, figure that out regardless. Um, and then the- I would rather see it codified. I have to be honest. Uh, for me, if it's not codified, by the time it gets to us, we can never say no. So, I personally think the the Mandor and Muse issue ought to be stated and codified, yeah. um, because it will actually solve, as Jack pointed out, a whole lot of other issues in itself around people just smashing as many units as they can in. So, I would want to see that codified. And so, Freddie, I think the question is. Could we get this done in two weeks and could we just table for two weeks and get it done right in once and we make all the changes? Yeah, that, well. that, that the sooner the better. And and, and that that's why I was saying uh agree that it should be codified. I just want to make sure that we actually can do that. If we can do that, then it'll it should be done. I think everybody's in agreement with the recommendation. Matter of fact, I wish that recommendation would have came up. Uh uh, when we were reviewing this, that would have probably saved a lot of heartache. Uh, we was I funny, brought we were, it up like 50 times, so I'm not sure why it didn't make it. I didn't, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny because we were driving that site uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'll be honest, and, I, and I'm just, I'm being, I'm being honest here. I was looking and I, I stood by that, uh, that track and I was like, damn, this this is dense. <laughs> and uh, it was it was one of those ones that you think like, OK, <laughs> this is this is kind of, uh, you know, you kind of get it when you when you start to really uh, feel <laughs> the space. So, OK, hey, hey, Dave, I've, I've got a before we move on, I, I do want to just ask a, a question to Freddie and, and I guess members of the task force. Um, you know, I, I think it's important that we're, we're seeing a lot as all. Even though we're seeing a lot of townhome development interest across the city, we're still seeing it in only a couple of narrow geographies. And, and I think it's important that whatever, wherever this ends, that it's broadly applicable across the entirety of the city. And and, and uh, you know, I represent a part of town where there's where we're we're pushing for more type of development like this, and and I'm optimistic it'll happen. I guess I'm interested in understanding as the task force was discussing and actually it's very uh, convenient that this is the slide that's up the four bullet points at the bottom you know i feel like the ones that have been controversial so there's like the big one in glenville that we you know we have just referenced but then there's the other ones where it's kind of the infill development um and and the frustration from some of the neighbors is just that the scale of the townhomes is not in line with kind of the scale of the existing houses and i guess i'm wondering if there's been a consideration for like in addition to the height and the roof forms of just being like general neighborhood plans and city plans because i think that there's places in town where there's a justification for denser development than what currently exists and in many cases, it's, you know, Cleveland went through a boom period. Uh, we saw rapid growth and maybe the housing that was constructed in that era is not the type of housing that is needed in the long term uh, to to have that kind of, of density. And I guess part of me sees uh, the role of the planning commission as being forward thinking, uh, looking towards the city of the future and the existence of the landmarks commission is kind of a check against that unbridled progress 
Um, so I, I can pause with that, but I think you understand what I'm getting at is there's parts of town where, you know, maybe a two bedroom house built on a slab near a rapid station isn't what we want moving forward. And I wouldn't want new projects to be knocked off because what is could be a very good project just doesn't match with the existing form. Uh, one, I want to say, uh, I 150% uh, agree with what you just said. And um, just so you know, um, we we get our butts kicked, to be quite honest, um, when we exercise this idea of having housing diversity. Um, because we often get hamstringed to, uh, to this whole notion of context, context. You know, there are certain neighborhoods. Um, we just went through this with Hessler. Okay, and we were lambasted, uh, you know, uh, with respect to certain people's perceptions of what was what we were doing and we were still within the family of what was happening uh uh in that on that very intimate tight street that's pretty well defined and what we found ourselves doing um as we go out and talk to people we keep expressing this notion and we've been doing it since we adopted the last comp comprehensive plan uh councilman is you know promoting this notion of various product types and really tying it to not just a rationale with respect to design and scale but also tying it to economic development um, one of the things that came out of the form-based zoning you know uh dialogue over the last few years was you know having multiple housing units on a single lot now you if you would have said something or proposed something like that uh you know, a few years ago, people would have looked at you like you have a third eye on your head, you know, and it, now these conversations are becoming much more digestible depending on where in the city that you're talking about. So the question for us, I think, is about design and design review and the Planning Commission's authority allowing us that flexibility. And what's challenging about, like, the current code, it, it hamstrings you. We need an envelope where you can have the flexibility that you're talking about. And I think that's where a lot of these updates and things kind of gives us that wiggle room. You know, I just don't know uh, how uh, definitive you want to be with respect to your, your, your code. If, in fact, you want that uh, autonomy to be able to be flexible where it actually makes sense. So I just I, I got to say I agree with everything that you said. And that's been. Uh, that's been a challenge for us. Yeah, my, uh, my, my fear is just that I think that there's, you know, it, we, there's a lot of ideas that get support in at the macro level, but when it comes down to micro projects, um, that there, there starts to be some pushback. And, and I, I think that one of the charges of this commission is to find a way through that disconnect. And I just wanna make sure that as as this process unravels uh that we're still able to have the flexibility to uh look at larger plans look at the greater good look at what's good for the city and not be so narrowly focused on design where we're we're un, unable to achieve new things so i don't know i might be out in the wilderness on that one but uh, it's, it's, i think that that's where i see a lot of the the, the controversy coming when these projects come forward well, if you're out in the wilderness, I'm either out there with you or I'm like further out. So just... <laughs> you're in the woods with the rest of us. So, um, the operative word is planning, guys. And I agree with Mr. Slife. <laughs> so, so let's talk about because I know there's people that are going to need to leave and I don't want to lose the quorum and everything. Uh, so, Kyle, Juan, Jack, are you still on the phone? Yes, uh, yes, I am. Hey, Jack, by the way, thanks so much for you and the AIA spending so much time going through this with us. Uh, you guys were very, very helpful, and I do appreciate all the time you spent. Thank you very much for including me today. I'm most appreciative. No problem. So, Kyle, I guess the question is, there, there were a few things brought up is because I, I'm kind of weighing two things. I'm weighing, do we get some of this stuff 
approved today because obviously as as people uh, put in their applications, they're going under the old, you know, townhouse code. I'd rather them go into the new townhouse code or is this something we can do pretty quickly? I heard you say the 10 foot setback was one of them that we talked about. That's an easy one. That's changing a number. But this whole idea of the the man door and the muse and the notice um, uh, in design, um, how much time would it take you to kind of figure those three things out that Lillian brought up? Um, so the 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 notice and the man door thing, I think, are going to take longer than two weeks to 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 workshop that and make sure we get it right. The the man door one specifically because um, there's just a lot of implications throughout the code uh, when you when you try to uh, when, when you when you I'm just kind of thinking through it because I've done this a few times now, modify this code that you know that one's going to be a big change and and we have to make sure that it, it doesn't have unintended negative consequences elsewhere. Um, and then the the notice one, I think that's going to have to be a Freddy decision. Um, but those other small tweaks, I think we could do pretty quickly. And I kind of like the idea of the sign on notice, and because then neighbors that are around that area would see it. And it goes back to what August said about having specifics. You know, this is a townhouse, and you know the specifics about the project and the specifics about. They coming in front of planning commission so they can uh, voice their opinion. Um, not, so to be devil's advocate, not to be a devil's advocate, but um, I think changing it twice is confusing. And I, Kyle, I, I would say you're amazing. I think we can get the Mandor thing done in two weeks. It's pretty simple. <laughs> I mean, I really want to say is like, it's actually one though that if you get in there and you have to tweak it later is more about preserving the like it's not it's not it's one that's actually more of a safety concern like if you know what i mean like a safe thing so i would suggest we push and get this done in two weeks and do it once because it has to go to council so unfortunately i've been at around city hall long enough to know that we're never going to make the other two we really won't not in this administration and not in the next for a while so either we do it now and we do it right and we do it fast and we get it done and I'd be willing to do it in two weeks with you and help or whatever. I say, let's do it. Okay, Kyle, you heard it. Okay. We'll From the go on with it. mouth to your ears. And if you come back in two weeks and you're like, man, can of worms, this is too crazy. Then we'll vote the rest in, but let's try. Right. Okay. So see what we can get in in two weeks. How's that sound? Guys, guys, Tom and I have to leave. So. Can we pose a motion to table this with the condition that those three or four items be seriously uh, looked at to be incorporated into the zoning code? In the next two weeks, correct. That's the motion weeks. and date certain. We'll see you in two weeks regardless. All right. Okay. And Thank we you need so much. To, we need to, the last three uh, minutes, uh, we need to uh, get So that's a motion. Do I get a second on that? Second. Okay. Motion is second. Uh, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downey. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. Okay, motion carries. Okay, go ahead, Freddie. Okay. Because we don't um, want August to leave to on close, us. Listen, because we have to close out, there uh, was a one other presentation that was going to be given. Uh, so we're going to uh, put that on pause. Uh, it was with respect to the... Uh, tree preservation process that we discussed. Uh, so we'll put that on pause given we have key members who have to leave, but uh, we're ready to share that uh, process information with you guys because that's something that we discussed. Um, just a couple of key dates that I want to uh, mention to you guys. Uh, many of you already gotten the uh, 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 notification from me about the uh, Sherwin-Williams HQ and the special meetings that are going to be hosted uh, with respect to that. Uh, we will be in touch with all the logistics and specifics around that. Um, like to thank Mr. Uh, Chairman Bowen and Jack Bylowski, Julie Trott, and some others who've been in discussions around that coordination. Um, so we're working through that. Um, you should have received a concept uh, proposal uh, for you to digest in advance of the meeting that's going to be taking place on the 20th. 
And uh, just so you know, we're going to have a marathon of adoptions this summer. Um, that's going to require us to do things a bit non traditionally with respect to location. Um, the Clark Fulton uh, master plan, which is uh, as a result of a conversation yesterday is going to be taking place uh, in uh, late September, early October. Um, Lillian, this one is uh, no, very important to you. The Midtown master plan. We had a conversation with uh, Jeff. Uh, Jeff's folks over there, and uh, we want to adopt this looking at an August date. Um, and we want to do this out in the community with respect to these plans. Um, and Jeff seemed pretty excited about that, uh, but we'll need to locate a venue. Um, and the venues that we locate for these have to have the right technology to be able to have the hybrid meeting. I know that many of the planning commission members were okay with having meeting off site. Um, the other two is the Buckeye Road uh, initiative, uh, which just uh, got completed, and then the Euclid TLCI. But what's most pressing is um, July 16th, uh, our agenda is going to be very light uh, uh, because we want to focus on the vision for the Valley plan. And for all of these neighborhood plans uh, that we want to adopt, we need to give these plans the time that they deserve rather than them being tucked in an uh, agenda and having a 15, 20 minute presentation. Uh, because a lot of the recommendations as we read these plans are very innovative. Um, they really deserve our attention and you will be receiving information on these plans in advance so you can actually get an opportunity to digest some of what it's saying before you actually see it. So I wanted to highlight that because that's really important uh, for us. And then uh, lastly, uh, the law department David and I had a brief conversation with members of the law department yesterday, um, and we're going to uh, try to get someone here to kind of talk about procedures in pre uh, the executive session discussion um, that we uh, initiated at our last meeting. So uh, those are just some updates, uh, but do expect for the tree preservation plan to be given um, at uh, our next meeting. Uh, but just keep in mind, our next meeting agenda will be light with the majority of it focusing on the vision for the Valley plan. And we will be informing you of the location uh, once we verify the technology. So um, that's the mayor's, I'm sorry, the director's report for today. And uh, I think we made it out of here by 11 as all of you wanted to, uh, to do today. So thank you so much. I wanna thank everyone, especially Lola and Curry for spending her vacation with us. It was very nice of you, and uh, I'll adjourn the meeting. Hey, David, before we close out, yeah. um, could I just um, could we take a quick moment? I just want to recognize uh, we we lost a, a friend and former colleague last yes, week, yes, yes, Tom yes, Jordan, yes, yes. Um, uh, who's you know uh, a good friend, a, a great planner, and and you know I appeared before this body in partnership with him on different projects, and it's it's a real loss for Cleveland and all of us, and I just wanted to. Uh, take a moment and let us all get a chance to, you know, remember him. So, yes, thanks, Charles. The funeral services for Tom is uh, tomorrow uh, in Hudson. I can share with you guys the address and uh, get you contact information just in case you want to send condolences. But to echo uh, Mr. Slives, I found out uh, this week actually um, uh, that he had passed away. He was only 41 years old. So. Uh, you know, I just want to say to all of you guys, just remember, we, we do this work because we love it. You know, um, we should always, you know, stay positive. You know, life is short, you know, and it's, it's I'm thankful, you know, to be a part of, of this. And I'm sure you're all, you know, uh, are grateful to have the opportunity to shape your community. So just for, when you think about Tom and remember his age, uh, just think about life on a day to day basis, you know, and that we need to have fun with this and enjoy this, you know, and it's it's, it's good to be with a group of people who are passionate. So let's just stay optimistic, guys. Amen. Have a great weekend, guys. Okay, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. All right. Thank you.